Welcome back. A recurring theme from the first session of the morning was uh, discipline, and I must praise you for displaying an admirable discipline in, in returning after lunch and doing it on time. It is a pleasure to be able to introduce the, the next panel, the next session, and there's a fine irony in the fact that we've asked a professor of military history to moderate a session on technology and technological drivers for future war. Um, it's a pleasure to have you, and uh, we look forward to your moderating it with discipline. Thus instructed. Thank you very much. Um, well, I don't think it's uh, so ironical to, to ask a professor of uh, military history to do this, um, uh, because uh, of course we have always been facing this this challenge of judging what is the uh, implications of uh, present technology uh, for future warfare. In uh, 1906, um, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Emperor uh, Franz Joseph was once attending a troop parade. Uh, sitting on his high uh, his horse he was uh, then looking at a uh, uh, at a model first generation model of a primitive prototype tank and then the emperor declared um, with a sour grin on his face that this phony thing will never have any use in uh, in warfare and then he rolled off on his horse and as we all know tanks did have certain implications for warfare in the 20th century <laughs> Well, um, we have a very, uh, very rewarding panel this uh, for this uh, first afternoon session. A panel which I'm sure will keep you awake, in, uh, even if you have been overeating the good and healthy lunch uh, prepared for us. Um, I will very, very briefly present the three speakers, and uh, before doing that, I will also remind you that I'll be, be more or less following the same um, uh, scheme as uh, my predecessor as. Uh, as moderator, that is, each presentation will be given 20 minutes from the moment I pass the word, and I will be be, um, be rather strict on that, and then we should be able to have uh, time for a joint uh, good long uh, Q&A uh, session uh, afterwards. Um, so, what do we have here to, uh, for the afternoon session? First of all, we have uh, Dr. Thomas Hammes, who is a distinguished research, research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. And he has been serving, among other duties, uh, for 30 years in, um, in the Marine Corps, uh, authoring numerous books and, uh, and uh, book chapters and articles uh, over the time. And then next, we have Professor Christopher Kruger, um, who is from the London School of Economics, um, professor there in international relations, and also um, having published immensely on uh, different uh, aspects of uh, warfare, including uh, books on um, on contemporary and future war. And uh, finally, we have one of our own colleagues, um, uh, Assistant Professor Eben Uyde, um, uh, who is um, uh, a PhD in, um, in, uh, in, in law studies and who has been, um, uh, until recently, was actually employed at the Danish uh, Joint Defense Command as a legal um, advisor there, but since August this year, Ibn Ude has been an uh, assistant professor uh, of public international law here at the Institute of Military Technology. And now, I think I've taken sufficient time uh, from this session, so now I'll pass the word to our first speaker, Dr. Thomas Hammes. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Jens for the invitation here and for the coveted after lunch spot. Uh, as well as for having the confidence to take a Marine infantryman with a degree in history and ask him to talk about technology. <laughs> it's a bit of an experiment, so it's probably a good thing I'm wearing a tie today. <laughs> I'm also going to go out on a limb and I'm going to explain to Europeans how you should defend Europe. Uh, there may be a little bit of a hint because we might not be here given the current administration. Okay, there's the disclaimer, probably too late at this point. I don't speak for the administration or the Department of Defense. <laughs> so this is kind of the key question. And you may ask, why would I ask the question is how can small states achieve deterrence? Doesn't NATO achieve deterrence as a whole? Well, there's a little problem with that. 
two key issues. The first key issue is NATO's readiness to defend. This is uh, an article from 2017. Germany had 97 total operational Leopard 2s and 29 total operational combat aircraft, NOAA submarines. The Ready Brigade this year, the Ready Brigade that's gonna rapidly reinforce the Balts, has nine of 44 Leopards that can operate. It only has three of 14 Martyrs. The other 11 aren't even there. UK, the other big contributor, can deploy a single brigade. How fast it can get out of town is a separate question altogether. The other problem you've got is there's a very high cost to improve the current force. If we build a force that looks like the force we have now, which is, as I understand the current plan, make a big heavy brigade, we don't have the money to do it. Willingness to defend is the other big problem. This is a survey from 2016. How willing are you to defend your country against an invasion? The deeper red it is, the worse it gets. You'll notice that the big countries that NATO has always counted on on the European side, Germany, France, England, or UK, have very, very low propensity to defend. By low, I mean in the 20s. That's how much if your country is invaded, not if NATO's invaded, but if they actually get to your country and come across the border. That was the survey. So the question you've got to ask yourself as a small state, if NATO wants to come, does it have the equipment to come? And then if you're counting on the United States, how do we get here in time? We do not have the ability to lift heavy forces into Eastern Europe. The good news is there are four converging, tech there are converging technologies from the fourth industrial revolution. This is Klaus Schwab's model from World Economic Forum of how the world is changing. And there's a short book on that's worth reading, written by him. I'm gonna talk about only these five. There are a lot of technologies that are coming and some are gonna have massive impact. One of the most noteworthy will be biological and nanotechnology are gonna have huge impact. But these five have immediate impact that you could start employing today. This could allow deterrence without increasing your budget significantly. You could do this for under 2%, I think, or needing an increase in available manpower. The first is small warheads. What you're looking at here, and the reason I did this for a small warhead, is that's an explosively formed projectile. You can see from the size of the guy's hands, it's a big, beefy Brit, so, you know, it's not that small. But it only weighs 30 grams of high explosive, 10 grams of copper, and a couple of grams of plastic. So for under 50 grams, I have a warhead, the punch through a half inch of steel. Now that doesn't sound very impressive, except that that will stop any wheeled vehicle. If I plunge into the engine compartment and blast that projectile through, I'll get a mobility kill. If I hit any aircraft parked on the deck, I get a complete kill because I'll probably get a secondary. Any mobile rocket launcher, anything like that is subject to catastrophic kill because if I hit the box of rockets and fire a hot projectile in there, I get a secondary off either the rocket fuel or the explosive warhead. Now, what makes this even more interesting is with nano explosives, this is the unclassified version, seven to 10 times the power of TNT for weight. Start to think about what that means and how small your warhead can be to get devastating effect on the type of target you're dealing with. <clears throat> and again, this is for looking at putting up a conventional defense that, that takes away the option of Russians moving conventional forces at a very low price, which allows you to use the rest of the investment to deal with the subversion and preparatory actions that they plan to take. These are drones, and the first three down here I put in because they're commercial. That's the DX3. Range, 1,500 kilometers, totally autonomous, vertical launch and recovery, about a 10-foot wingspan. That one, 2,400 kilometers, totally autonomous, uh, IR infra and optical. It's used for oceanic surveillance. That one's a delivery drone. It carries 20 pounds, which is a pretty significant explosive. Uh, it carries at 500 miles, sustained speed of 150 miles an hour, 800 kilometers, sustained speed of over 200 kilometers an hour. Vertical launch, vertical recovery. This one is even more interesting. This is a drone made by Kratos called the QX222. Kratos has made drones for the US government for years, but they make cheap drones because you can't make expensive airplanes if all you're gonna do is blow them up. So they use their cheap drone model. For $2 million, that will go 2,400 kilometers with 500 pounds autonomously. It is stealth configured, but not stealth coded. It is vertical launch and vertical recovery. Since it's cheap at two million a copy, you could actually send it on a one-way trip of 4,800 kilometers. 
It has bomb bays for two small diameter bombs or two air-to-air -air missiles, so it actually handles its own terminal guidance too. The real advantage is when you have vertical launch and recovery and no pilots, you don't have a pilot training pipeline, you don't have a maintenance training pipeline, you don't have airfields, you don't have retirement costs, you don't have golf courses or oak clubs. <laughs> so you re bring the price down, so for the price of one of your F-35s, you could buy 50 of these to start with and a couple more every single month by not flying the F-35. Oh, by the way, this has twice the operational range of an F-35. Every one of these things outflies an F-35 for range. You've built a big expensive airplane, parked out an airfield that anybody can find on Google Earth, and made it vulnerable to a half ounce of explosive. Other than that, it's a great idea. <laughs> Now, the next thing is 3D printing. Uh, or advanced manufacturing, gives you capability plus volume. This professor in 2014 built that drone. He was asked to 3D print a drone, so he developed this thing and he 3D printed it. Uh, it flies 50 kilometers, costs 800 bucks, and is fully autonomous because it uses a cell phone. They think it flies 50 kilometers. The student insists on getting his cell phone back so he won't let it fly more than 20 kilometers and then back. But that's what he did. Now, he printed and assembled that in 28 hours. This is a 3D printer plant, about 100 printers there. Except now we've got carbon 3D printing, which prints 100 times faster with a goal of 1,000 times faster. Today it's printing a little over 100 times faster. So if I had 100 printers in a single day, I could make 10,000 autonomous drones. If I have 1,000 printers like the UPS plant they're building today, that's, that's 100,000 drones a day. Autonomous drones a day is the capacity for a single plant. So these things are coming at you like machine gun bullets. If you start thinking about drones as an expendable round of ammunition that hunts autonomously so you don't need 100,000 pilots, then you get there. So the next question is, if I've got these, can I launch them? And the answer is yes. This is the Navy's LOCUS program. There's 24 drones coming launched out of that. These are actually coordinating drones. They're, they're more expensive because we're Americans. We've got to have it fancy. So instead of just having drones that are dumb and firing a time on target, ours coordinate. That has a powerful additive effect. This is the Chinese. These are the uh, harpy version of the Israeli Harap. That'll go 400 miles. The Israeli version will go 600 miles. I got to figure the Chinese have figured it out. So 18 on a two and a half ton truck, 54 in a battery, 162 in a battalion launch. Think about the air defense problem as these guys start swarming you in large numbers. These are fully autonomous hunters. They're also 10 years old. They hunt in IR, optical, and infrared and they outrange the F-35. You can add cruise missiles, a little bit older technology. Cruise missiles have been around for a long time in rockets. This box of rockets from the Israelis, uh, eight of those, 50 kilometer range. Here's the Marine Corps. This is a man portable system that can get out there. But as you go down to smaller ones, the Marine Corps has much smaller a switchblade. You could put about 500 of those on the back of a five ton truck. Or better yet, you'd put them in a 20-foot container. Why a 20-foot container? Because there's no way to preempt 20-foot containers because you can't kill all the 20-foot containers in a country. This is the Chinese version. Just to show the Chinese are building it too, all you gotta do is paint it blue. This is the Russian version. That is four cruise missiles against the anti-ship cruise missile version, 250 miles, 250 nautical miles. The land attack version, 2,400 kilometers. You would not put that on your target list if you saw it sitting parked in a field with the lid closed. And that's their point. They also show it down here on a small inland craft, all the way up to a massive container ship. What you've got to do, since anybody can see you and anybody can target you, we've now entered an era of not just precision, but mass precision, and by mass I mean 100,000 a day coming at you. If you can be seen, you will be killed. So you've got to create, you can do one of two things. You can dig in, or you can play Where's Waldo. You have that book over here? Where's Waldo, the kid's book? Play Where's Waldo. And this is Where's Waldo. So sailors in the group don't feel left out. This is the Slocum Glider. It's a commercial product, $100,000. It'll stay at sea for five years, fully autonomous, GPS guided. When I saw it, I immediately thought self-deploying uh, sea mine, smart sea mine. And that's what you can do with this thing, of course. Um, 
University of uh, Michigan Tech University has decided they can do it cheaper. They do it for $10,000. It's not as effective. It can only stay at sea for three years. But that means you can mine the harbors of Russia from here. You walk out, you put this thing in the water, push it, hey, it'll take it six weeks, eight weeks to get there, but you can mine it. When you add aerial delivered mines, you can get very, very rapid mining to, to lock them up. And cheap space, uh, the general talked about this, but cheap space is coming fast. This is the Space Power New Zealand's contribution. New Zealand has a launch pad now. They're launching once a quarter. They're putting up one of those rockets. It's 3D printed. The plan is to launch weekly, and what they launch is CubeSats. With a collection of CubeSats, they're claiming half meter resolution of the whole planet every 24 hours. The company is Planet, and Planet plans within six years to be able to do it every six hours and maybe even every four hours. So the idea you're hiding forces as they move around, this is in optical and infrared and they're working on synthetic aperture. This is the Indian space program. On that, on that rocket launch, they have 104 satellites. Three of them are big ones, 101 are CubeSats. They're going up fast, they're going up all over the place, and they're gonna be ubiquitous. And in this, of course, is a solar-powered Zephyr. That goes up to <coughs> 80 to 90,000 feet and stays up six weeks at a time is the concept. It's still under development. The key thing is the idea that you can hide, you can go out and camouflage yourself and hide and move around is just going away. You're gonna be seen, unless somebody destroys space. That's a possibility. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about AI. Our other two uh, speakers are gonna talk about it. And again, this is an instrument's version of artificial intelligence, so you gotta take it with a grain of salt. AI is an enabler. It is a technology that enables all other technologies. It is not the technology. General AI is equivalent to the human mind. I'm not even gonna discuss that because there's a huge argument whether it will ever happen. The key thing is what they call narrow in the literature, and I prefer task-specific artificial intelligence. Why task-specific? Because of that specific thing, it is better than any human on the planet. <laughs> Go can't literally cannot get itself out of the room, but it'll beat anybody who sits down at the table with it. <laughs> Task-specific AI. And what that means is it enables both mass production and mass employment of weapons. Mass production, because if you're gonna purchase 100,000 drones a day, you're gonna have to have task-specific AI-driven robotics, loading, et cetera, getting into the canisters and moving it out. And then a mass employment of weapons, because let's face it, you can't, you're not gonna have 10,000 pilots. And that would be a regiment's worth of weapons. An infantry regiment would have access to 10,000 of these. So you're gonna have to have AI do it for you. And uh, AI will come first in the air environment because the air environment's simple and that's a nice symmetry because pilots are too. So you have pilots up there and so AI is easier to manipulate that way. <laughs> Then there comes the key question, should a robot be allowed to kill? Kill, And this is a huge kerfuffle in the United States. There's a huge argument. What is the current status of autonomy? This is the Human Rights Watch people definition of the different types of autonomy. In the loop, a human must make the decision. The weapon can identify, orbit, locate, but was not allowed to shoot until somebody actually fires a trigger. Human on the loop, recognizing humans are too slow to keep up with lots of weapons, the human is just watching all these weapons and interferes if something's going wrong. And the third one they say is human out of the loop. I say that does not exist. Until Skynet arrives and can plan the whole war, build them, deploy them, and shoot them, there's gonna be a person involved somewhere. The person is the guy who starts the loop. In reality, we've had autonomous weapons since the first caveman dug a punji stake pit. You dug the pit and you decided you were gonna let it kill on its own. But you also set the parameters by how wide you dug, how deep you dug, how heavy the cover you put over it. You decided what you're killing. Am I, am I hunting a mastodon or a human being? What do I use for poisons on the tip? Am I gonna eat this thing I kill or I just wanna kill it? So that's the human starts the loop. And we have that now in modern systems. The captor mine since 1979. This is an anchored torpedo we put in the bottom of the sea and it listened for Soviet submarines. But once it was activated, it hunted on its own. Aegis, of course, in a special mode, close in weapon system, Patriot. We've got post launch lock on uh, air to air missiles. Uh, and we have the Harpy, of course, been around for 10 years. So the fact is, us arguing over whether weapons should be allowed to kill or not is a lot like being eight months pregnant and arguing about whether you're gonna have a baby or not. <laughs> this is a little late in the discussion. 
But the discussion remains important to convince civilian leadership because they will set the parameters. What we really should be discussing is how does the human start loop? What are the parameters for the designers? What are the parameters for the operators? How do they change from theater to theater and level of conflict to level of conflict? Instead of wasting energy arguing over if, we need to be arguing about how and experimenting with how and getting it right. Because our moral obligation is to make sure this weapon does what we want it to do after we release it. We've already decided we're releasing it. Okay, so what can frontline states do? Um, you can deter through denial and punishment, a combination of small drones, boxes of rockets, barrier plans, and IEDs. By IEDs, let's face it, we have not solved IEDs in 17 years of war. So if you buy ammonium nitrate, which you have to buy to fertilize your fields anyhow, hundreds of thousands of tons, and put in containers, and the reservists are trained not to fight like an infantryman, because you can't train a reservist to, to fight against a regular armor formation. What you do is you teach them to build bombs, and you give them remote detonators. And upon mobilization, his cell phone goes off, he's mobilized, he goes and gets his bomb making material, goes to his company commander, draws a detonator, and sets up bombs. Now these bombs can be everything from from small, like the little ones we're looking for, to a 20-foot container, which is 50,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate. Now, if you're the lead guy in an armored column and you hit that first 50,000-pound explosive, it's academic to you because you're gone. But the second company is going to go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> do we really want to do this? And they convince them to go ahead, and they hit one. Third company's going, we're going to have to figure out a different way to do this, boss. We are not going. So a thick network of these combined on the deep knowledge of the terrain and people, it's the locals know what's trafficable in winter or summer or spring. And then fields of IEDs and regular forces provide counterattack. And of course, a big important element of this is the information plan. It does you no good for deterrence unless the guy knows you can do it. So if once a year you fly a swarm of drones at the border and they turn around all together and there's no radio emission, so he knows he can't jam or use his EW, and once a year you set off a 50,000 pound IED, you, make, you send a message. <laughs> Supporting states, you're going to deter through punishment. Coastal states, adding ship cruise missiles and mines can control the sea. Inland states, containerized cruise missiles, VTOL drones, etc. So what are the operational implications? Defense is becoming much stronger. We're maybe seeing a period of defense dominance at the tactical level. NATO states can deter Russia with in-place forces. Why? Because you can't wait for us to get here. And most of the other NATO states don't have enough to come, so it doesn't make much difference. But if you have this in place with cheap mass precision, you've got to ask yourself a question. Is manned aviation obsolete? When everything out there can outrange your aircraft and your aircraft operate from fixed facilities, they're just waiting to be killed. I'm going to ignore your airplanes in the air because it's hard to find them. Once they're on the ground, they're easy to find. The other thing to remember about stealth aircraft is they're not stealthy in daytime. You can see them. <laughs> So that's a problem, and it's a huge investment. You can go other way. So rethink the operational comment, concepts. Think to turn defeat with in-place forces. You don't have to wait for reinforcement. Train and organize. Rethink procurement. Stop buying this few exquisite. Focus on small, uh, smart, and relatively inexpensive. And that's my contact information. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hammes, um, both for a very interesting uh, presentation, but also for uh, keeping in line with my, uh, my ambition to, uh, to run this according to the timetable. And uh, next will now be uh, Professor Christopher Kruger on talking uh, since about war, artificial intelligence. So we'll more or less pick up where we left. Thank you very much. Well, you may be surprised that uh, someone talking artificial intelligence isn't going to use PowerPoint. <laughs> Many years ago, I used to give a series of lectures uh, during the Cold War, and a student came up to me, one of these eternal students, who regularly attended my lectures every three year, uh, once a year for three years. And uh, I said, you know, why are you doing this? Because my lectures never change, just a few updates. And he said, don't do yourself down, Professor. I'm charting your intellectual development through life. <laughs> 
Well, believe it or not, I have developed since, but uh, I have not quite made it to PowerPoint. Uh, I'm waiting to be replaced by an AI at the latest opportunity. <laughs> by the way, I did get my revenge on this fellow. Uh, his father owned a hotel. He introduced a game reserve. He had a habituated balloon, a uh, balloon, sorry, baboon uh, colony. Uh, and uh, he sent me an email to say that he had been hospitalized because he got into a fight with a baboon. <laughs> so I sent him an email back saying, well, surely the only reason you get into a fight with an alpha male baboon is over mating rights. <laughs> <laughs> So I've never actually heard from him since. <laughs> now, my underlying message, as they have a business conventions, what's the takeaway, is, is chill out and don't be too worried about artificial intelligence. But i just give you three stories. In 2016, for, I believe for the first time ever, an IT company in Hong Kong put an AI on its main board. Last year, two oil companies discovered that their respective computers were actually talking to each other. They stumbled upon this. They didn't know until rather late in the day. And last year, a law company uh, in, the, in London discovered that one of its uh, AI systems was lying to its clients. Uh, well, yes, we are more and more machine readable. <laughs> and lawyers lie all the time. But they announced that they were shocked by this. <laughs> the point I want to make is that artificial intelligence as the word says, AI is uh, intelligence, but it's not agency. And I'm here to explain why uh, AI systems, until they become self-conscious, the Skynet uh, prospect, which, as you said, scientists dispute whether that's ever going to be a possibility, but until that day, uh, we will still, I think, be in control. I'll give you an example. Kasparov, you may remember, the, the Russian chess player, beaten by uh, an AI system. Uh, but as he said at the time, look, if I I had had access to the database of every single game that's ever been played that this system had, I might have stood a chance of winning. Well, we actually do now have access to every single uh, game that's ever been played. It's called a Centaur system. And that's why we have twice the number of grand chess masters that we've ever had before. We're getting better at chess thanks to AI. And anyway, who wants to sit around all day watching two machines fighting it out on a chess board? Uh, chess is about competition. Uh, it's a sport. It's about competitiveness. And only human beings actually compete with each other in this particular way. Now, it's quite true that we have AI systems that, which are replacing us uh, one by one. I will be replaced soon uh, by an AI system because, quite frankly, uh, professors are, are actually expendable. Uh, I think, uh, General, you'd be quite happy to know that <laughs> in the light of your uh, skepticism about training. But there's a, a company in Chicago called Narrative uh, uh, systems, which expects that within three or four years, uh, journalists will become redundant and AI systems will be writing most of the articles, not only about uh, our future, but also their own. There are medical uh, systems which are much better at detecting cancer, for example, than even the greatest specialists. They're more accurate and they're faster. War is, of course, what worries us. Um, and I'm here to explain to you why AI systems are not going to replace us in war. What is the point about artificial intelligence? The point is uh, that artificial intelligence um, gives you uh, certain advantages, which I've already uh, touched upon. But the three reasons why they won't be replacing us are as follows. Uh, we are motivated uh, agents. Agency comes from having a motivation, from having an ambition, uh, from wanting to achieve something. We have these ambitions because we're governed by emotions and instincts, which have all been hardwired into us by natural selection. We're also hardwired to compete, to dominate, to try to control others. Uh, these are natural, unfortunately, aggressive instincts that are going to remain part of the human condition for the foreseeable future. But we're not as bad as uh, baboons. We actually have emotional and social intelligence. Uh, we realize that other people have motives as well, that other people also wish to dominate and control us. We have to live in that kind of world. Computers, uh, artificial intelligence doesn't have motivation. Um, the philosopher Daniel Dennett uh, says this about motivation. It's about intentionality. And he gives us three uh, things that we do every, every day. 
If I believe you know something that I need to know, that's one order of intentionality. If I believe that you believe I know something that you need to know, that's a second order of intentionality. If I believe that you believe my business partner, partner knows something, that's a third order of intentionality. Now, then it tells us that these three orders of intentionality we use without thinking about it every day. We're capable of five orders of intentionality, in fact. No machine, he believes, will ever be capable of intentionality. In other words, reading motives. And if you can't read the motives of other people, you really can't do war. Second thing is that machines are non-teleological, so they don't ask questions such as, why am I here? Who's put me on this battlefield? What am I doing here? I'm being shot at. Why? Is it for God? Is it for country? Is it for family? Etc. Etc. They don't have a teleological language, one that produces a sense of purpose. And that sense of purpose is being used. I'll give you an example, David and Goliath. Who was going to win that particular encounter? It's very clear that David uh, had all the cards uh, in his hand. Poor uh, old Goliath was suffering from gigantism, which is why he was over seven foot. One of the side effects of gigantism is you have no peripheral vision. So if you're dancing around all the time, as did dear old David did, uh, poor old Goliath couldn't see him half the time. Secondly, he happened to have a technology called a sling, which was one of the most effective weapon systems in the ancient world because if effectively used it could pierce Bronze Age armor. Poor old Goliath was weighed down by these useless spears and shields. But thirdly, and this is the point, when David went back to the Israelite camp that evening for lessons learned, he uh, wouldn't have said, oh, I won because of all of those things. He would have said, I won because my God happened to be greater than their God. I was used by God. That's agency. I'm a servant of God. These stories we tell ourselves all the time are extremely important. So Bellow, the author, uh, has a character in one of his books who says, for God's sake, make use of me. Only do not use me without a purpose. Our sense of self and sense of self-esteem, which we have, derives from how useful we are to other people. Uh, and if you're a jihadist blowing himself up for God or for whatever reason, then you have a gift which you have given. You have a sense of agency. We may not think it because you've terminated your life, but that's good enough. A robot programmed to self-destruct uh, is not martyring itself. It's not offering a gift. It's not a choice. It's not part of a robot's social repertoire. And thirdly, machines are logical, and we're logical too. We have mathematics, we've invented logical systems, but we don't actually use logic to navigate through the world. We use rationality. And rationality uh, is difficult because we suffer from something called cognitive impairment. Social psychologists will tell you all the reasons we go to war, When Martin Van Creffeld was explaining this today. All the reasons we go to war, well, one of the reasons we go to war is social psychology. Cognitive uh, dissonance, misunderstanding, in fact, the intentions of other people, confirmation bias, premature cognitive closure, scenario fulfillment. We all know about these things. I've been teaching them for years to my students. Interesting thing Daniel Dennett says is that they are hardwired into us, this social impairment, not for decision making, but for social bonding. Because it is in fact by misunderstanding the intentions of other people that the tribe bands together against an enemy, real or imagined. And then it says, that is rationality. Well, one of your great uh, scientists, the physicist Niels Bohr, put it very well when he told a student to stop being so bloody logical and start thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the worst words that have ever been said against a student. Robert Oppenheimer, who managed the atomic uh, bomb uh, system, was once heard to tick off a PhD student by shouting at him, you're so young, and yet you have already achieved so little. <laughs> I don't think I'll try that out on students. I don't think they will survive. <laughs> You've all heard about Asimov's three laws of robotics. Interesting thing is, if you look at a magazine called Computer Magazine, 1993, two articles by Roger Clark, who tried all sorts of permutations to see whether these laws of robotics could actually apply in our human-built world. And every time he found they couldn't. And it wasn't because the robots in this case were not intelligent. It's because social life is not algorithmic. 
That, I think, is something that we need to grasp. And war, until it becomes algorithmic, what Clausewitz said is war by algebra, I strain a point slightly there, but nonetheless, that is the term he used. Until we have war by algebra, we are going to be stuck in this social human world that we have built. We make exceptions in other words. However, things are changing, and there is a new relationship that we have with algorithms and with machines. We're going to have to treat them as collaborators and as team members more and more. And the most comprehensive analysis I think that's ever been made of human-robot interaction, which was published in 2011, that was the point that was made. We have to start treating them as team members. And there are three reasons for this. One, that the report mentioned, and two, that I will add. First of all, the extensive coding that is going to be required for semi-autonomous, but particularly autonomous systems, means that none of the programmers will themselves have an overview of the entire program. They won't know the whole package. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we will have to communicate with those algorithms, and they will have to communicate with us once we start to use them in the field. Second reason, John Markov, his chief science uh, writer of the New York Times, says it's important we don't treat machines machines as slaves, that we treat them as team players, otherwise we risk becoming redundant ourselves. An example he mentions is GPS uh, for the correction of navigational uh, errors. It's a great invention, but it also reduces our ability to remember and reason spatially, and that's extremely important if you still happen to be special forces behind enemy lines. Two other reasons, uh, and I shall conclude on this note, why we should treat machines increasingly as team players. And the second reason is we shouldn't allow them to determine reality entirely for us. There are two people in this relationship, unlike Princess Diana who talked about three people being in that particular relationship, but uh, there are two people in this relationship, ourselves and machines. i just give you one example of what happens when you become utterly dependent on something else determining reality for you. And it was that famous episode in Mogadishu on the 3rd of October 1990 you've seen the Ridley Scott film Black Hawk Down. Have a look at Mark Bowden's book on this subject. He uh, interviewed uh, a lot of the survivors of that, and what he was fascinated to find was that they all used the same terms. We were betrayed. We weren't warned that that was a situation that we might find ourselves in. But the word they used, which was very indicative of their generation, was it was unreal. The whole thing that evening and the next morning was unreal. We have to also have some role in determining reality for ourselves. And the third reason you already know from perhaps reading newspapers about US judges who now rely on automated risk assessment tools when setting parole and things of this kind, that's already been happening. I talked to a British judge quite recently about this, but as you know, some of these systems are statistically biased, uh, in this case against uh, African Americans because the largest group of people in prison happen to be African. Americans, machines have biases as well. They're not cultural biases, but they're statistical biases, and we have to sometimes correct them. So although we're becoming more and more machine readable, uh, and although we're going to have to work uh, more and more with machines, and indeed we'll only get jobs if we can do so, the fact is we will still be in control, which I think was the point you were making. We're not out of the loop yet, and I don't see ourselves being out of the loop any time soon in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, again, for a very, very uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, also once again thank you for, for keeping in um, uh, with the timeline. I think actually we are getting a little bit ahead, which probably is to the benefit of the uh, last speaker in this session, and the last speaker being Professor uh, Yves Mude, who will now be talking about control on the battlefield, um, rethinking the human role and target selection and, and engagement in the aids of autonomous weapon systems, the legal perspective, and uh, I should probably be... Well, thank you. I have to first be able to control my, um, my gear here, but I think I'm okay now. Um, now, technology has brought us to a crucial threshold in humanity's relationship with war. Um, and in future wars, machines may be making life and death decisions on their own. 
This quote comes from um, Paul Charest's uh, recently published book on autonomous weapons. Um, although I don't think it's accurate to say that machines will be like making life and death decisions all by their own, I do think that he's right in pointing out that we have reached a critical moment where we have to start thinking about the way in which technology changes the role of humans in warfare and what, how we're going to deal with that. Um, so therefore, uh, today I would like to talk to you about how existing law of armed conflict deals with these changes, and more precisely, I would like to be able to give you an impression of how the law of armed conflict limit the, limits the extent to which we can, um, we can uh, isolate or reduce human control to the planning and the pre-programming of weapons and then leave it to uh, the weapon itself to execute targets. Um, and in my opinion, this is extremely important because it seems that there's almost universal agreement that artificial intelligence and the related attribution of autonomy to weapon systems will be a major driver of future wars. Um, but why the focus, the rather narrow focus on control? Well, there are many other interesting aspects of autonomy, but I think that control is essential to military operations. And I think that I can spend my 20 minutes with you here better uh, by talking about something that will actually affect the way in which military operations are planned and carried out in the future, rather than more theoretical questions such as how to regulate, how to attribute responsibility, and so on and so forth. Um, and I realize that most of you sitting here know a lot more about um, technology and war than I do, both at the uh, practical and theoretical level. But I do believe that I can actually offer you um, a, a different and more practical perspective on autonomy here um, and something that you may be able to factor into your defense planning in the future because I would like to provide you with realistic perspectives, perspectives on the extent to which you can actually exploit the benefits of autonomy if you want to stay within the limits or confines of the law. So my presentation will around, evolve around the following three questions. First, what kind of technology are we talking about and how does it affect the nature and timing of human control with target selection and engagement? Secondly, does compliance with the law of armed conflict imply a requirement of human control with target selection and engagement? And thirdly, does the law of armed conflict limit the extent to which we can rely on front-loaded procedural human control with target selection and engagement through planning and mission-specific programming? So first thing first, um, let me begin with the um, technology. And I will avoid the rather toxic problem of um, defining autonomy. I have had a TX uh, doing it before me and I think, uh, I think he, he did it really well. What I would like to underline here is that when I talk about autonomy, I mean autonomy in the functions of selection and engagement of targets. Secondly, that um, any system that is capable of or operating on their own in these functions after activations are considered autonomy for the present context. That doesn't mean that I think it's a very good word to describe it or or, um, or that I think that all weapons that falls under this category is necessarily or are necessarily interesting from a legal perspective. It's just to point out that we, what we're talking about is the fact that weapon systems that can operate on their own after activation forces changes in the way human control is exercised. And I would like to underlay, uh, underline that the autonomy is facilitated by, um, or yeah, facilitated by sensors and AI-driven um, data analysis and decision making. And that, you know, for the present purpose, it won't be uh, necessary to distinguish between automatic, automated, and autonomous systems. That is something people normally spend quite a lot of time arguing. When is a system what? As long as it's a system that is capable of carrying out target selection and engagement after activation, 
that's what we're talking about here. Um, although I do, of course, realize that the complexity of the systems and thereby um, the legal, potential legal problem will increase as the system becomes more autonomous. <laughs> Now, many of you may already have gathered that the rather large no or broad notion of autonomy that I'm using here covers a lot of different weapon systems. However, um, I'm a little bit short on time, and we already have had an introduction of all the systems you see up here by TX, so I will skip through that and instead move on to what this is really about, because even without being able to predict exactly what kind of weapon systems we will be faced with in the future, it's quite clear that they will have one thing in common, and that is that they change the timing and the character of the human control being exercised. And <laughs> in order to illustrate that, I created a um, piece of infographic here that um, is supposed to show you three things, rather rudimentary, but still I hope it does the job. Now, first, the figure is supposed to show us that the framework for control, <coughs> that being human control, the target selection and engagement, exceeds the narrow ODA loop, which is normally what we refer to when we talk about the loop. Um, and by then, we can, it allows us to see that human control can actually be exercised at many different stages of the operation. Um, and as I understand it, there's actually quite a lot of control going on, both at the uh, initial planning phase, at um, the strategic joint level, and at the final planning, um, the tactical level mission planning, where um, where it's being decided what, how to um, how to target the, speci the specific targets and which um, weapon systems to deploy, and all the all the tactical decisions are being made, and that is an exercise of control, in my opinion. Um, drafting of rules of engagement at the uh, at the initial planning phase, target development, um, force planning and assignment are all activities that help ensure that the attack will have the desired outcome and no inadvertent effects. Now that doesn't mean that we never see attacks with, in, with inadvertent effects, but this is a way of exercising control. Secondly, the figure illustrates how control is distributed throughout all of these phases when using non-autonomous weapons. That means uh, any other weapon that doesn't fall under the definition that I just gave you. And it means that in these situations, human input is not limited to what happens before um, the pulling of the trigger, so to speak. And most importantly, it shows us that when using autonomous weapon, human input and, input and control will be limited to mission, um, or li limited to be carried out during the planning and programming phases. That means that the um, functions carried out by the human when using autonomous weapons will also be that of planning and programming of the system. And activation, of course, at, as you mentioned already, TX, um, deciding when to activate the system and under which circumstances. And this means that all human input must be conveyed to or rather programmed into the system no later than the point of the final mission-specific programming, which makes mission-specific programming, as I see it, the main channel for the exercise of human control, except, of course, if we decide to keep a human uh, in the loop after activation to, um, to supervise the operation and also interact with it if something changes. Now, this means that human control with uh, target selection and engagement when using autonomous systems will be of a more front-loaded procedural kind. Um, but in my view, it's still control, as I already said, because by enabling planners and programmers to set the precise target criteria, define the area of operation, the timing of attack, and the munitions to be deployed, um, in a way that reflects the specific circumstances of the operational um, environment of a particular attack, the weapon system's course of action can be, can be um, restricted or contained within a human-defined parameter space, which increases the likelihood of compliance with both commander's intent and the law-found conflict. 
So saying that machines will replace humans in the loop, as you said, um, seems like a mistake to me. Rather than pushing the human out of the loop, the use of autonomous weapons pushes the timing of exercise of human control to the left. And it shifts the nature of control from direct positive control throughout all stages of the operation to um, a situation where it um, becomes indirect procedural control exercised before the activation of the system. However, while f such front-loaded um, procedural control is definitely control in my opinion, that doesn't mean that it's actually fit to ensure that we can comply with the rules of distinction and proportionality on the battlefield. And that brings me to the second question of this presentation. Namely, does compliance with the law of armed conflict imply a requirement of human control? Let me be perfectly clear, there's nothing in the Geneva Conventions or the Hague uh, regulations for that matter that explicitly um, state that there's a requirement of human control with target selection and engagement. <laughs> Um, so then the question is whether such requirement can, is somehow implicit in the wording of, of the relevant provisions or in the nature of the principles of distinction and proportionality. And I'm not convinced that that is the case e either. In my opinion, <laughs> In my opinion, the fact that the precautionary <laughs> obligations in Article 57 of Additional Protocol 1 um, is placed with those who plan or decide upon attacks is merely revealing an underlying assumption of human control. And it underlines that the legal responsibility for implementing the precautionary rules rests with human beings. That means you can delegate the function, but you cannot delegate responsibility. Um, so while it is true that those who plan or decide upon attacks refers to human beings, I don't think that the wording should be taken as a deliberate decision to exclude the possibility of human-defined machine decision-making. But of course, it says that you cannot delegate responsibility. Now, I'm also not convinced that the very nature of the uh, principles of distinction and proportionality um, implies that only human beings can make decisions about who, what, how, and when to attack, because they require some sort of mental capacity to perform complex qualitative and value-based assessments that only human possess. <laughs> Although this is relatively often claimed, it seems to me to be an argument that is predicated upon a very particular understanding of technology according to which machines will never be able to carry out those very complex um, assessments. And I'm not sure that that is the case. I mean, who knows what we're going to be faced with in 20 years from now. It's very difficult to predict both the pace and direction in which artificial intelligence will develop. So who knows? what we can do 20 years from now. So, the way I see it, what we're dealing here with is what you might call a de facto requirement of human control. In other words, the difficulties of applying the central rules on target selection and engagement in practice and the current technical limitations of weapon systems and artificial intelligence means that you can only comply with these rules uh, if you allow for human judgment and control of the critical functions. And this is especially the case in very complex and dynamic target, target settings where lawful targets mingled with protection civilians and some actors seem to resort to unlawful practices as a matter of strategy. In such environments, identifying lawful military objectives and calculating proportionality will be extremely difficult and it will require qualitative analysis at a level that computers cannot currently handle. So as of now, we need to keep a human in the loop to make sure that these decisions are made correctly, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will remain like that forever. Um, now, the exact nature and timing of the human control required for a particular attack will depend on the concrete circumstances of the attack and the weapon system being used. 
In principle, it could be enough to rely on procedural front-loaded control, i.e. control via pre-programming, that sets up very restri restrictive pre-programming that limits both the type of targets and the circumstances under which the system can attack. That could suffice. However, in practice, the effectiveness of control through pre-programming may not suffice to meet the legal requirements. And this brings me to the last question. Namely, does the law of armed conflict limit the extent to which we can rely on front-loaded procedural human control, and thereby the limit to, or the extent to which we can operate weapon systems without keeping a human um, in a supervisory role, at least? Um, the answer to that question is probably yes. Um, in order to ensure that the principles of proportionality and distinction is respected in practice, Article 57 um, contains an obligation or a general duty to take constant care to, share the, uh, to spare the civilian population. Um, and this duty implies or means that you have to conduct ongoing reviews of the information on which the attack is based, and you have to readjust the planning in order to cater for the changed circumstances if necessary. Ultimately, attacks that have already been planned and must be cancelled or suspended if it becomes clear that the um, circumstances on the ground forces a different status determination of the target or it tilts the proportionality assessment to, toward excessive um, collateral damage. So if something happens on the ground that changes your assessments, then you have to readjust your planning. And ultimately, it also applies to attacks that have already been initiated. Um, if the system is not beyond the point of human control, that means you will have, if possible, you'll have to call back an airstrike or reprogram a missile in flight in order to make sure that it doesn't hit something that um, that is not, in fact, a military objective or something that would cause collateral uh, damage of an excessive kind. But how does that affect the extent to which we can rely on pre-programming as a means of human control to ensure compliance with the rules of proportionality and distinction. To what extent can we plan and program our way into compliance with the law of armed conflict? Um, quite simply, I believe that the extent to which we can fulfill our obligations of distinction and proportionality um, will depend on first the pre predictability of both the target settings and the system's actions, and secondly, the time span between the final uh, planning and mission-specific programming and the release of weapons. So. That means that um, when predictability, or sorry, unpredictability increases, so does the need for human control after activation. And likewise, if, if there's a long time between the final programming of the system and the actual release of weapons on the target, then the need to, um, to keep a human in the loop after activation also increases. So it will depend in the end on the actual circumstances. Um, and in static, that means that in static and highly predictable target settings, it will arguably be possible to rely on status determinations and proportionality assessments that are or have been made during the planning phase and then pre-programmed uh, pre into the system. On the other hand, in cases of attacks on individuals um, and attacks in dynamic complex urban areas, it will for the time being be necessary to keep a human, at least in a supervisory role, after activation. And perhaps it's worth mentioning that as of now, most of, or at least many of the existing systems that would uh, qualify as autonomous are actually being operated with a high degree of human um, control even after activations and even after or even in situations where it's not necessary from a technical uh, point of view where the system could actually operate without that human oversight. 
So by now, I hope that it is clear to you that, um, in my view, the, law, the lawful use of autonomous weapons will not necessarily push humans out of the loop, but rather change both the human role in the loop and the nature of that loop itself, so that it will extend beyond the narrow odor loop, and actually the framework covers the entire planning and execution phase of attacks. And it has forced a shift in the nature and timing of human control for target selection and engagement from distributed direct control towards front-loaded and procedural control through planning and pre-programming. But hopefully I also managed to um, convince you that the laws of war already, or law of armed conflict already contains provision um, that can handle this. Provisions that restrict the extent to which autonomous systems can be employed without human oversight, at least for the foreseeable future. It's my hope that you will consider this um, in your uh, strategic acquisitions and in the creation or revision of doctrine or procedures for, um, for operations in the future because I think it's quite ex important that you have realistic expectations as to the extent to which you can actually make use of um, the, the full potential of autonomy. And if you as military leaders and decision makers want to be able to take, these, to take the advantages of the potential benefits of uh, autonomous systems in terms of better, faster and more precise weapons, I suggest that you act smart on the technopolitical scene. Because countering the current agenda to ban killer robots is going to take um, an active uh, stance from you the way I see it. You have to, or it would be wise to articulate which kind of um, technology we're actually talking about so we don't get the impression of killer robots. And it would be nice to underline that autonomous weapons will not render existing command and control structures and procedures for attacks void, but that these systems will in fact be subjected to a very strict control regime and be used within the confines of the law. And that's important because it may help you educate, educate not only the p political decision makers but also the people who vote for them. And ultimately, that is extremely important because as you, Professor Coker, um, have pointed out in the very end of your late book on, um, on uh, the future of wars, the future is not a destiny, it's a choice. And that means that ultimately human beings are in control of the technological development not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eben. Um, and uh, now I think uh, we, we, we got three very um, different but also uh, very interesting uh, presentations uh, bringing us first from, from getting an insight into the implications of uh, uh, new and emerging technologies for, for small and medium sized states defense then over uh, um, uh, over to, to looking into the essence of artificial intelligence and then eventually also getting out some of the legal implications of uh, 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 artificial intelligence. And the combination of these three different presentations I think give us a very solid ground for discussion and, uh, and questions. And uh, as during the, the previous session, uh, first time speakers uh, are uh, kindly invited to present themselves by name and uh, institutional affiliation uh, if, um, if relevant. And we already got the first uh, uh, comment or question by Professor van Krefel. Thank you. Uh, question to Christopher, please. Uh, you know, uh, nobody knows because nobody read it. I wrote a few years ago, history of conscience. A history of conscience, very relevant to what you were saying about artificial intelligence. And at one point I asked my son, who is a world-class computer expert, but he's also a practicing psychologist. I asked him, do you think computers will ever be able to develop a conscience? And you know what his answer was? No, but they may be made to behave as if they had a conscience. So what would you say to that? 
It's directed at you. Right. <laughs> is, very, um, is this on? Yes, a very, uh, very good uh, question. I, well, I, 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 suspe I think that is actually the answer. There's a wonderful Asimov uh, short story called The Eftable Conflict. It's about a world in which the entire world economy is, is wired into a system of computers. And because they run it far more successfully, logically we might say, rather than rationally, uh, there, are, there, there are no problems. There are no depressions. There's no unemployment. There's no underemployment. Everything is going wonderfully well. And then one day they notice there are a few blips and they have to send humans into the loop again to fix these blips. And then an intelligent scientist begins to speculate, I wonder if these machines have actually become self-conscious. We haven't recognized this, and now they're feeling sorry for us. We shouldn't be redundant on the food chain. <laughs> there should be a need for us. <laughs> Also, of course, it's a Darwinian imperative, because if we feel that there's no need for us, we might just switch them off at the same time. So perhaps the conscience could be a reflection of a Darwinian imperative, the needs to survive and work with us. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, if that uh, is, is the case. But look, I mean, to be very specific, in the world of uh, semi-autonomous systems, or fully autonomous but not self-conscious, I mean, there is this fellow, uh, Arkin, uh, who for years has been working away uh, under commission and contract to build a conscience into the next generation of computers uh, and uh, has come to the conclusion, well, I think he's no longer trying. Uh, he tried, but it didn't work. But I would like to reverse your question on its head, and I would like to just put a pitch in for the roboticists here who say that actually going in this direction is a moral demand of history because it would give us, if we can produce machines that are more consistent in the way in which they apply the Geneva Conventions, and that's all that a conscience in a machine means. Geneva Conventions and consistency in applying it, that would be a moral upgrade. And will keep us in the war business with a good conscience for much longer than would otherwise be the case. I mean, one of the speculations here is whose conscience? Mother Teresa. Says it's on. It's on. It's on. Uh, the, the question is, who's conscience? Do you want Mother Teresa's or Hannibal Lecter's? <laughs> and culturally, you're going to have that. We have a conscience, but if you take a look at other cultures that place group above individual, etc., I don't particularly want a machine with that conscience. And of course, that's going to be one of the problems. You will be able to get there with deep learning and the, the processes they're using, uh, but then the question is, whose model to use for this? Next uh, speaker, will be, uh, next uh, question will come from Admiral Ruibach. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit out of the, the, the subject here, but again, uh, with reference uh, to uh, General uh, Cartwright's uh, example of uh, military treatment uh, increasing the survivability from uh, 60 to 95 percent and uh, making the transformation into using mat machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, robotics uh, into military education education, military decision making, military uh, advisory into the future, not only in using a uh, weapon system, but also in making ordinary staff work, education and so on. How do you see that uh, kind of thing develop in, into the future? Um. For the military side, there's kind of a historical record on this that when a new technology comes along, first it's a helper, and then it's a partner, and then it's a replacement. Uh, the other thing from a military point is very often it's a range function. You become range obsolete. Uh, for instance, the armored knight could kill any crossbowman. He just couldn't get close enough to do it. Any battleship can kill any carrier. It just can't get close enough to do it. So I think if we look at this helper partner replacement process, whether it's in combat systems or it's in administration systems, we have to do it. The problem then comes back to the whole institutional inertia. Uh, we didn't get carriers dominant in the Pacific because the battleship admirals gave up. We got there because they sunk the battleships. And I think that's the problem, is who sinks the battleships. Any other ones? Yeah. No. Okay. Next, uh, Christian comes from, um, or comment for that matter, from um, Dr. Kim Gordon. Yeah. Um, 
So I think this has been a fascinating discussion about like the the ethics, legality, all that. I'd like you to go in a slightly different direction and think operationally for a second, right? How would we integrate potentially general AI, but let's leave that to one side, narrow AI with targeting systems, with kinetics, with like, how would you like to see an, an op concept that applies all this stuff, right? So I'm, I'm thinking about it from the standpoint of a book that I'm sure you guys have read, which is William Gibson's book, Neuromancer from 1984, right? Um, which is a classic of, of cyberpunk, um, which has effectively uh, a physical penetration team with an onboard narrow AI that happens to be the person of a downloaded dead guy, right, that has to be rebooted every time and reminded what the mission is, you know. And then they have a general AI that's actually fighting another general AI. Uh, and there's a whole series of, of interesting military observations that are more than 30 years old now that are only just now starting to become possible in the technology. So while I think this is a great discussion, and I, I, I think it's been very informative, can I ask you to be sort of a little more, like, tactical, operational for a second about how you would use this and what it would look like? Well, I might, I might be the person who knows least about um, CONOPS here or um, design of operational use of autonomous systems, but I read um, an analysis of how the Aegis uh, class um, ships are actually in integrating uh, autonomy in, or how they are handling the autonomy in the system. Um, that emphasizes that it's extremely important to remain in control throughout the operation. Um, and the way they do it is that they create, and I know it's a defensive system, and that's relatively more simple than in an offensive um, context, but they have created, and by they I mean um, the operators and planners, have created different doctrine for the system. Three or four different modes of operation, you might say, that all reflect commander's intent, and they're designed to, to address different situations in scenario. And so when, when the ship actually um, comes in scenario, they decide what is the current um, threat situation, which kind of doctrine do we use, and it's only the commander who can actually implement doctrine and activate the system. And to me, that's a really good example of how to, I know, you know how to try and, 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 and restrict autonomy and mitigate risks in this environment. Partly, be partly because they're extremely nervous of repeating um, the shooting down of the Iranian air, um, also airliner. But, but it's 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 a really illustrative example of how autonomy is bridled in a concrete uh, yeah. system. Well, that, that's just an automated version of weapons type weapons. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. uh, the other thing is, it's still fully autonomous when you go to weapons special. When you go to special mode, it's fully autonomous. If it had been in special mode, it wouldn't have shot the Iranian Airbus down. That was a human decision that overrode what the system wanted to do because of human error. So I think operationally, your point about how far to the left are you, in a uh, low intensity environment where we're studying pattern of life, things like that, the human has to be in the decision. If that's a matter of time. You've got minutes to hours to days to make that decision. When you're in a tight fight with lots of objects in the air, then human, if you leave the human in the loop, you're taking a moral responsibility for killing your own people. You've got to decide. And so that's where you, as you get down to those microseconds, you have, you go through the thought process, when will I go fully autonomous, and that's when you go. And that's what I would say would be the layout. This will get more and more intense as we, if we go to small, smart, and many, and some people are already. I mean, the Russians' uh, use of uh, cruise missiles, the Chinese use of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles will completely overwhelm any defenses we have in Japan already. So we have to be already accepting that we'll be fully autonomous in that fight. So I think you think this through and decide, it's a lot of how much time do I have, what is the risk to my own forces, what's the opponent look like, and you've got to do this, and that's why I say you start out with the start the loop parameters, the careful discussion has to be what do I want to design into my system for options, what are the operators instructed, like before the Aegis deploys, they think through all the different operational concepts, and the guys going to the Pacific are very different than the guys going to the Gulf. So they think through that process, and then it comes down to the decision. Now, the easy thing about either Aegis or SeaWiz is there's one guy. 
uh, that works fine, but if you're in a, uh, if you're in an air group in a strike, it's gonna be a bunch of guys out to make that decision. And if you're down on a ground combat, there may be hundreds of people in the decision of when I go autonomous and when I don't. So this is all gonna be part of the training and education and working from the start to loop process. That's where I think we have to start working. We have to get over this idea of saying we're not gonna use autonomy. We say it and we lie about it regularly because we're trying to keep the uh, people who don't want killer robots. So we lie to those people. Uh, and to do that, we lie to everybody else. But essentially, we have been consistently lying about this. But if you actually read the DOD documents, they're kind of weasel worded. And they, they leave you room to go autonomous, just like this uh, international law does, but mostly because when they wrote that, nobody even thought autonomy was a possibility. And so use it. Well, I would imagine uh, in the, uh, for the next generation or so, the, uh, there'll be three advantages to having AI systems uh, deployed uh, in the field. One is uh, probability analysis. Uh, so th going back to the old effects-based uh, operations and philosophy that we don't use much these days, or we don't use it by name, but still they'll be able to measure the effects uh, more successfully purely on number crunching, probability analysis. Uh, is that enough for measuring effects? Well, the second thing is that they'll have possibly greater cultural competence than we will. So we won't have to send human terrain teams again into the field because they actually will know everything. They'll know the languages, uh, they'll know the cultural sensibilities, uh, up to the point where we program with all this knowledge, of course, but they can also reprogram themselves and become, uh, the, the learning curve will become even more impressive, I think. There. And um, there was a third factor, but because I'm not an AI system, I've forgotten what it was. <laughs> Now to Anas. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Anas Barman. I'm from the Institute of Military Technology at, th at this place here. I have two questions. One is directed at Dr. Hammocks, and the other is directed at Professor Koga and uh, Professor Eben. Last week, I attended a conference at the Copenhagen University about killer robots, and one of the, or beyond killer robots, one of the speakers there, his argument was that we were thinking about AI uh, in comparison to small states and medium size states all wrong. We didn't need more of, uh, you know, industrialized war and to quote another speaker at that conference, killing people and blowing stuff up and then plus AI. We needed to think in all new ways of prevention, predictability and the use uh, of AI in, in that capacity as small states and, and medium sized states and that was where the effectiveness of AI lied. <laughs> Do you think there is anything to, to this argument? Uh, can you and is that a, a military thing? That's my, my question for you. Is your presentation is that actually just industrial war plus AI, or uh, how do you see the other question for Professor Koga and Professor Eben? Is um, you talk uh, Professor Koga about um, thinking of machines as collaborators, uh, and uh, when we begin to see this uh, collaboration of machines uh, or uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, and humans, how do we uh, access, how do we uh, think about, uh, you talk about agency, uh, even talked about responsibility and control, where uh, do these things lie? When machines and, uh, and humans start to collaborate, uh, is it a Latourian notion of networked or mediated responsibility? Uh, is it only the machine? Is it, uh, how, how do we think about these uh, human factors like agency? Uh, uh, to quote the uh, British philosopher Bertrand Grossel, he talked about no man treats his uh, motor car as foolish as he treats his fellow men because if uh, the motor car don't go, he don't say bad car, I'll not give you more petrol. Is that going to be the, the future that we're going to punish robots or how do we understand these things? Yes, thank you. Okay, on the first question, um, in my talk, I was talking about what you can do from now to the next five to 10 years to make an immediate difference in, a, in the operational and strategic situation here in Europe. Um, as far as the idea that AI will talk the guy out of it, that's fine. But as a shore patrol officer, you'd go into a bar where there's drunks having a dispute and you would try to talk them out. But you always had two NCOs standing off to the side with nightsticks. And if the talking didn't work and the guy was just drunk and wanted to fight, they could take him down fast. You want to be in that position. I don't want the AI to be just talking, because suppose the guy's drunk and wants to fight anyhow. 
And if you look at human history, there have been a lot of fights based on drunken rage type approach. Not that the Danes were responsible for a lot of that in England or anything. <laughs> We civilized it. <laughs> you the breed. Uh, I, I actually remember my third point for Dr. Kilcullen's question, which is uh, situationism. I think that's the other thing about AIs. The, the fright and flight dynamic uh, is completely missing, and so that, that removes the hu a very important human element in war. Because if, you're, if you want the laws of war to be obeyed, or if you want to run a prison like Abu Ghraib and you don't want a few bad apples, as the president would call them, uh, then the situation is the same for a robot. It's different for human beings. It's interesting, for example, in Abu Ghraib, people like Chip Fredericks, an Indian his boyfriend, was defended by Philip Zimbardo, specifically on the point that he was a good guy in a bad situation. And that this idea of Aristotelian virtue ethics, which we still uh, teach in military academies and colleges, is is in fact uh, we should go out of teaching it because it doesn't work in particular situations. Uh, the machine will always be better because it, for that reason. Situationism is now one of the biggest growing ethical schools in the in the United States, and it's interesting for that for that reason. You know, the, the wonderful story of the you go to a seminary in Princeton. They they did this and they teach you to give a sermon on the uh, Good Samaritan, and then after 45 minutes they look at the watch and say, Hey, you're already late for your next class. Us, hurry up. And so they leave the room and there's an actor pretending to be a homeless person slumped uh, in, in an alleyway. And what do they do? They cross over to the other side because they've got to get to the class on time. That situationism, that's the human element that makes us the weakest link uh, in the entire chain. That's war, unfortunately, so far. Now, on your, on your question uh, about collaboration, we've been collaborating for years. I mean, this idea, Bruno Latour's uh, thinking about this actor network theory. Uh, wolves, the domestication of wolves. Where did we learn our social skills from? There is now a new school of thought that it was from observation of wolves. The pack, the ability for collective action, uh, empathy, the family structure there. We may have learned some of the best uh, and, and, and most what we consider human defining elements about ourselves from observing other animals. And the collaboration between wolf and man, all those wolves that they know the old wolves, that if you throw yourself on a bison and the bison falls on top of you, that's not very good for you. They can see people throwing a spear. They know that these people can be worked with. That's the wolves who decide to, to, with that decision. 90% of them go off, of course, and don't collaborate with us, but they do. And the extent to which we, of course, have been machine-readable from day one, you know, the old argument, Plato's argument, what you lose from going from an oral tradition to a written tradition, you're actually giving something up here. And we can see this with the digital world. I can see it in my students who have memory for nothing now. Um, because everything is on a laptop in front of them. Fine, it's called progress. Uh, let's go in that uh, direction, I suppose. But we're only beginning to wake up in the last 50 years to the extent, not, uh, not only to the extent to which technology has changed us, but the extent to which we have been collaborating with technology. It's that wonderful Kevin Kelly book, What Technology Wants. I know it's very criticized, that book, but I love the, uh, I love the title. Technology does want something from us uh, in return for our use of technology. Um, I have a slightly more practical approach to that. As a lawyer, um, although I can see that actor network theory and Bruno Latour actually allows us to understand that weapons are not merely passive instruments. From a legal perspective, it doesn't make much sense to attribute legal agency to weapon systems. The responsibility should remain with the people who operate them. Um, Talking about punishing robots, fine, you can destroy them or you can uh, put them to jail or whatever you, you might consider. But what would the purpose be? I mean, there's no deterrence, there's no uh, retribution that works in, in that uh, context. So I think that we should focus on ensuring that it's possible to trace back responsibility to a human operator and that puts a lot of responsibility um, and heavy duties on the commander's shoulders because he would have to be able to actually predict uh, and assess and predict what kind of action he might anticipate from a system that might be self-learning in the far future. And that's certainly difficult, but I don't see any other way of doing it. And in the end, it might lead to a situation where commanders do not want to make use of highly autonomous systems simply because they're not sure that it will uh, act within the constraints of the law of armed conflict. 
Good. Now we are moving towards the last part of this uh, session. I will lump together the last three comments slash questions, so they will be asked uh, in a row, and then I will ask the panelists uh, to, to pick, cherry pick between the, the questions and comments in order to, to finalize in about uh, seven minutes from now. So we'll have three comments and questions in a row, and then you are free to reply to what you desire. So once again, Henrik Weidenbach from the Center for Military Studies at the University of Copenhagen. Thanks to all three of you for very, very uh, strong presentations. I have one question for uh, TX, um, and I'd like you to do a little bit of cocktail napkin defense planning for us very quickly, because it happens that we did a huge defense agreement, six year one, that we passed this January, which was basically based on buying very few, very expensive aircraft, building a huge heavy brigade, and buying a few very expensive pieces for the Navy. How would you? recommends that we do defense planning in this country. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take three of them now. Yeah. Next, Christian will come from over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Anas uh, Nielsen from the Danish Navy. Um, I will cherry pick on that because my question is also for Dr. Hems. I get this whole thing about 3D printing a lot of mini drones and sending them uh, over uh, to deter the Russians. Um, but believe it or not, that's not all we want to do with our military. We also want to be out there and like make a better world in, in Africa and places. Um, how are we going to use these mini drones uh, down there? or? Uh, Perhaps put it differently, what are we going to do uh, to defend our operations in these areas, perhaps uh, against uh, these things that they might use? What, what do we have to think about there? Uh, what are the implications for us in, in that part of... Like Hey, Henrik Nielsen from the Danish Air Staff. First of all, thank you for three very, very interesting uh, briefings. So my question is, or my question is, where do we go from here? If AI can solve military tasks from a kinetic perspective, but can't read motive or assure compliance with the law of armed conflict collateral damage constraints in a dynamic environment, what is the next step? Where do we go with AI from here? Yeah. Back to the panel. Okay. Um, Please hold the mic. On the first question, what would I? Yeah, just hold it close. Infantryman and technology. Um, <laughs> what would I do differently? Uh, I wouldn't buy any F-35s. Keep the F-16s, upgrade them, use them as a transition weapon. Look at something like the Kratos to give you the long-range unmanned strike. Um, I would definitely not buy a heavy brigade. That's just uh, lots of... An infantry squad in an armored vehicle is simply 11 guys neatly packaged for destruction. <laughs> Um, so we have got to start rethinking that. The equipment we've got now will last us through the transition. We have paid for this, we use it as we start to build the partnerships, and now we start testing. We, we look at what we've got and see where we are. For instance, in that helper partner replacement, we're already in replacement with strike aircraft against heavily defended targets. We send cruise missiles, we don't send. Uh, for long-term surveillance and low-threat environment, we use drones. Uh, for, for more and more ground combat systems, we're looking at using drones to go out and look. So those are the sorts of things I do. Ships are a little tougher because we're still working out the cruise missile problem, but I'd be looking, why not buy empty container ships? Put the cruise missiles in the containers. The container ships have a crew of 12. A weapons crew would be another 15. So we've got 25 people on a craft. You can then fill the containers with protective material or even make inner holes, depending upon how big it is. So it's a tougher ship than a frigate. It's a bigger ship than a frigate, and it carries a hell of a lot more firepower, and it costs a fraction to both buy, equip, and man. So I'd go look at that direction and continue to use your other stuff. How do you make a better world? You can't. <laughs> okay, we went to Afghanistan thinking we were going to create a state. The problem is first you have to have a nation before you can have a state. You Europeans managed to do that and on average only four to 400 to 1,000 years to get the job done. A lot of ethnic cleansing, a lot of blood, a lot of uh, incredible family fights, but you eventually got it done. Okay, that's where they're going to take. Let's say we're, we're 10 times faster because we're technology, so somewhere between 40 and 100 years, whatever you do. Then you use your technology for self-protection, you use it to get yourself 
off the roads like the Marines use the autonomous helicopter to move supplies. You can do things like that. Just because it's stupid doesn't mean politicians won't tell you to do it. <laughs> so you've got to figure out how do I use technology to minimize my casualties, minimize the impact on the civil society you're dealing with, and try to get some results, but you're not going to make it a better world. <laughs> And I think the people outside the base here today might disagree <laughs> with you on that one. Uh, on, on AI, I think the immediate, uh, the immediate challenge is, is uh, cyber, cyber warfare, because AI systems are now uh, going to have to increasingly take immediate decisions when we're under attack for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and we're actually abdicating and maybe abdicating control to AI systems sooner uh, than we've actually been talking about. Uh, and that will be a, a major challenge for us because of the escalation that is built in to that system. Um, what do we do with AI? Well, we deploy it where it does the things uh, that we do better. Uh, uh, we deploy it where it replaces us for the things that we don't need to do, like demining, for example. Running prisons, probably, to a certain extent. Uh, just look at the way that uh, in, in Gaza and places like that, uh, young Palestinians prefer a kind of robotic checkpoint to actually looking at Israeli soldiers because they can read the body language. So even if the Israeli soldier is very correct, in the behavior and is applying the law 100%, the body language betrays the hostility, the aggression, and, and the dislike. But what we mustn't do, I end on what we mustn't do, because I also agree we can't do a better world, is that if we intend to stay in the war business, we must have the conscience to do it ourselves and not abdicate responsibility entirely to machines. So I always like that uh, wonderful book, D Gently Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams, where there's a robot for everything. Uh, you can even buy an electric electric monk that will believe in God for you. <laughs> <laughs> And if you really have the money, you can buy an electric monk that will believe in things they don't even believe in Salt Lake City. Never say that, of course, in the Pentagon, because 10% of people are Mormons, and that will get you in trouble, and you won't get your invitations back again, as I know. OK, um, from a legal perspective, I would quite simply say that do not attempt to regulate, or at least do not attempt to prohibit or ban the use of AI in weapon systems. Rather focus on figuring out how to bridle um, autonomy um, in weapon systems in a way that will ensure compliance with the existing laws that we have because the existing framework for the law of armed conflict is actually really good in the sense that it's um, technology neutral. It applies with whatever kind of uh, weapon you, um, you use and it's there to ensure that um, that certain effects won't occur, that being, you know, killings of civilians and excessive collateral damage. So rely on the technology neutral framework we have until we know what we're talking about. Banning something that we cannot even define is very difficult. Thank you very much, panel, and thank you very much, uh, Nils, for moderating. Um, and thank you even for noticing my subtle bottle language um, in trying to make you stop. Now, coffee.